moving forward. And who better then to have the uh, Director of Athletics at the University of Houston, Chris Pesman, join us right off the top of the show. And we are apologize for the, the electricity out that we were on Thursday and part of the day Wednesday. It's glad to be back live in studio. Uh, Chris, thank you as always for your time. And yes, we will get into the men's basketball team and Kelvin Sampson and more. What are your thoughts about some of these, at least the speculation and reporting that the 14-team playoffs would have an automatic buy for two conferences and also even revenue changes. What what does that look like from your perspective and the Big 12? Yeah, yeah. you know, we're working through all that literally as we speak. Um, Brett gave us a little bit of an update earlier today, and then next week I think we're going to have much more conversation around that um, when we're in Kansas City for the Big 12 tournament. So I don't have a lot that I can really comment on at this point other than it's it's been very dynamic and very fluid, and I can promise you that Brett is working his butt off in the best interest of the Big 12, and at the end of this, we're going to end up in a good spot. I'm not overly concerned about it, to be honest. So when you hear things like these two conferences want the buy or they want this many, um, do you think that's uh, just maybe a little bit of salesmanship on their part to try to, to, to negotiate um, maybe a better, a sweeter deal for themselves? I think there's a lot of public posturing right now about what people want, what they're trying to do and how they leak information. I mean, what we heard last week was, you know, the buys and the AQs and then the public sentiment came back. And I think that recalibrated some people's opinion about how that, how we should be handling this. And so it, it I mean, from what we felt like it was going to be two weeks ago, it's changed a lot. So it, it, it tends to be very fluid and I, I'm, pretty certain we'll end up in a very good spot and and a spot that'll give us uh, the ability to adapt as this thing plays itself out. Uh, You just said something here that that caught my ear. You said the public opinion on some of that stuff came back. Do you feel that now the leaders of the college football playoff and the conference commissioners are listening to the fans more and what they may like more than they have in the past? Because there has always been a disconnect between what the fans want and what they've been fed. Yeah, I think we should. I mean, shoot. I mean, there's every reason to pay attention to what our public wants. I mean, if we're not listening to what the fans want, then we're not we're not doing our job very well. So I, I think that's been part of it. I think, you know, some things that were out there felt really heavy handed. And I think that maybe a lighter touch is needed with, you know, larger conferences and the way they're attacking this. And I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about the Big 12, just others without getting too specific <laughs> but um yeah it's it's just we're at a point where i think we're gonna have to make some decisions to to keep this thing going and and, and but be mindful of what the public wants and you know i've i've told people that uh, it watched european soccer when they tried to create the super league a few years ago and the public sentiment that cratered that effort because you were taking small market teams or smaller programs and you're basically you know, casting them adrift and isolating them and freezing them out from the ability to compete for, for a championship. And we see the success of what we have with basketball. Why would we not try to replicate that? And the smaller pool just, it, it creates an inability for the smaller programs to be able to get into the CFP. And certainly, you know, where we were coming from, you know, being an American and, and the path of access and how difficult that was, now at least we're opening it up more and how open we get it over the next, you know, one to three months or whatever this process plays out. We just have to be mindful of that. Chris, you mentioned the, the long battle for Houston to find itself in a league like the Big 12, and obviously we'll see what the future holds, as you mentioned as well, but uh, just the timing of seeing how everything's sort of falling and, and seeing the reports about what a, what a G5 school might make. I mean, is there any doubt in your mind that the, the kind of the door was closing and you guys got in right at the right time and that, uh, you know, just what is that feeling kind of like to know that, hey, at least we, we were able to make that move because otherwise, I mean, who knows, right? Yeah, I, I, it certainly feels that way. I mean, it's it's daunting. I mean, to think about where we'd be if it hadn't worked out. And, uh, it's, I, I'm very proud of the efforts that the university created or efforted to get us to this point, even before I was able to come back here. Uh, because yeah, it feels like a, a mob movie where they're closing the books, right? <laughs> when you're either in, you're out. Um, it, you know, not 
calling us the mob. <laughs> I don't want to, that yeah, could be misconstrued. I better be careful. But, um, but at the same moment, like, yeah, it, the books feel like they're closed for now. And, you know, that's why you're seeing, you know, some institutions being pretty aggressive with ways to find their way in. And because it, it, you're kind of, you feel like you're at this moment where you're either in or you're out. And it's in that, that chasm between the in and out is getting even greater and, you know, with NIL, transfer portal, compensating athletes, all the things that we're dealing with in our space, that chasm is only going to get bigger because resources are, you know, finite and more resources are getting pushed to the top than to the bottom. And how do you give yourself a chance to compete at the highest level? And, uh, you know, basketball for us, we're sitting here and with the success this team has had, the thought that we would not have that option mm-hmm. in a couple of years just it, it, it drives us to make sure that we, we continue to present ourselves with that option. And if we hadn't or we don't, then we're failing. Chris, with uh, all of what is happening, what you've been through, all of that, and then what is at least perhaps on the horizon, the Big 12 is going to fight, scratch and claw. You mentioned that with Brett and also the ADs and presidents. Does there need to be a plan B or do you not even want to go there and think that way? Um. I don't know that we needed a plan B. It, it, we feel pretty good about where we are, not taking anything for granted. Right. Um, uh, Brett has been very um, engaged throughout this whole process. He's been great with us, keeping us up to uh, praise with the ADs and the presidents, the people he's talking to, the way he's connected. Um, and he does an incredible job. You guys know this, but his, his Rolodex, his access to people at the highest level that are decision makers in this process and the way that he represents our conference has been extraordinary. And, you know, I don't want to, you never take anything for granted, but we feel very good about where we're at and about our future. And so the plan B hasn't really been that much of a concern. Obviously we're, you know, you're mindful of it, but I really feel about, I feel confident about where we are and where we're going to be by the time this all shakes out. Chris, do you feel a, a tide turning also in the, you know, the player uh, employee, like I don't want to call it player employee space, but at least among ADs where you guys would like a, a real structure, whatever it comes out to, bargained, whatever, just so that you know how to build an athletic department over, because it's not like something you could do year to year. You have five-year plans and 10-year plans that you'd kind of like to know this now, what it's going to be. Yeah, please. I mean, we're trying to solve an equation without knowing what we're solving for. It feels like, you know, and I wasn't a great math student, obviously, you know, if you know me, but you're sitting here and it's like you've got this, you know, highly structured formula and you're missing all these uh, inputs that you need to be able to solve it. And for us, the structure around what the athletes are going to look like, if they're employees or not, the compensation around that. We need those answers so we can start driving towards, you know, how we're going to build our business. Uh, you know, I was, you know, you spend a lot of time thinking about this and you think about the way our business is set up where it's been, you know, the sports teams are really isolated to an extent. But, you know, do you start setting this up like real pro franchises where you've got the front of house side of business, which in a sense we do, you know, you've got your external side and your internal side. But do you really start setting up where on the, on the sports side, you have general managers, right? Which in this case would be head coaches, but with the volatility of rosters, how do you start building your recruiting department, your player personnel departments, things like that, and building the structure around how you start supporting those programs and the transition of athletes in and out? Because you're going to have to be a lot more aggressive in the, in the transition space. But again, that comes back to resources where those things live. You know, you're, you're hearing conversations about people taking the recruiting departments now or considering taking the recruiting departments out of athletics and parking them in the collectives because there's no rules now. And then the ability for those individuals that recruit within the collective to go to the recruit and cut deals. And you're just like, what? Wait, <laughs> how would he, how do we get there and how are we solving those things? Because you, I use the analogy of building a house. I, I, I want to know where the first center line is on that house so I can start building out from there. And right now we don't have that. We've got a lot of moving parts. So it's hard to start building the economics of this and then the structure that has to go around it. So the short answer is yes, we need those answers. 
Chris, uh, obviously the conference and other conferences continue to evolve. I mean, there's going to be another four schools again next year, but you're about three quarters of the way through the first full year in the Big 12. Uh, just what have been your impressions? Uh, what has been just kind of the, the experience thus far? Obviously a, a very successful basketball program that we'll dive more into, but just in terms of the, the trips and the, the teams coming to your place and the games themselves, what's been your impression of, of life in the Big 12 uh, through almost an entire year now? It's everything we could have hoped for and it has been awesome um obviously we want to be competing at the top end of the conference for conference championships across the spectrum but i'll give you an example we've got baseball uh is playing at home this weekend with baylor um i think there's less than 500 tickets left for each of the nights um for our baseball series softball plays texas at home this weekend that series is completely sold out and obviously we've got kansas here in basketball tomorrow and that's been sold out for months that is what our fans have been dying for and to see it and then be competing at a high level like we are in many of our spring sports is just it, it's it, it, it's it's this is it this is what we wanted and and what's so cool is the regionality you and i we've all talked about that in the past on this program but the fans from baylor being able to jump in a car and drive out on here for the weekend it was us a couple weekends ago when we were up in waco for the basketball game drive up drive back in the same day stop at bucky's have a great trip that's what this is supposed to be. And the fact that we're experiencing it at such a high level is it validates everything that we had knew was possible and to see it really start coming together. And, you know, we're going to get there a lot sooner than people think. I, I really believe with football as well, you know, Willie's get here and, and the excitement and really the wind is at our backs around there. You know, I was out of practice this morning and it's just, feels like we're really really close to being at the high end of this thing as opposed to the opposite yeah and, and he's been there now for a couple of months we had him on this show and and we had had him on when he was at Tulane as well your overall thoughts about how they have put their machine together it, it was even faster than you thought the assistant coaches everything that goes with it he was very thoughtful and that's what I appreciate about Willie and, and nothing against anything that we've done in the past but just the way he goes about building a program um, you know by and large, you know, we lost a couple kids in the portal, but which you, which we saw at other places when we had had coaching changes in our industry. You know, you'd see a, a rush of kids hit the portal. I mean, that may still happen to us before the season, but that hasn't happened yet. Those the kids that are here really want to be coached. They want to be good, and uh, we've got a great staff that's built around them that I think is going to give us a chance to be successful. I know, I know, I don't think I know is going to give us a chance to be successful. What is Willie Fritz like in a job interview? I mean, we talked to him a bunch of times, but I'm just curious as like, because he is such a, like a smart dude, but like in that position of you're trying to get a job, everybody can be kind of different. I'm just curious about that. Uh, he, you know, it was really, it was awesome. It was very conversational. Um, I, you know, I'd never really, it's shocking. I never, I'd met Willie a couple times, you know, at, you know, coach you know, like conference meet, uh, meetings, things like that, and, you know, have a drink and just shoot the bull a little bit. Um, but during the interview, it was great because his vision and his excitement for the opportunity here at Houston and his connections back to the state of Texas and to the, to the institutions that were around here and his familiarity with what we are trying to do here was just, it was awesome. And, it was not, we weren't selling each other. It was just, you know, we knew who he was. He knew, he knows who we are and what we want to do together to be successful. It was, it was really a conversation. And the hardest part of it, frankly, was just respecting what they were doing through that process. Because much like we had had happened to us a couple times playing in a conference championship game, we did not want to distract from that. And he told us during the interview, he goes, look, I'm not going to take this job over the team I'm coaching. And frankly, that sold me. Um, I was already sold, but hearing that, his approach about it, but, you know, you, you guys know how these things work. You know, we, we met Sunday before this, the, before they played. And then we were, we talked, everything went through his agents So not being able to talk to him and you get towards the end of the week and you're like, we feel really good about where we are, but we're trying not to distract him. And you just like, man, if this thing goes south and he doesn't sign, I like, I'm, I'm screwed. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to be out of a job. Um, but fortunately it, it worked out and I was able to sleep really well Saturday night after, after they played. But, uh, 
yeah, there's some really uneasy moments when you're sitting there and you're like, man, I hope this works out because we got to go back to the street and start all over again. It's, it's going to be rough and we're going to lose some time because really what you also get worried about is the, is how much time does the search take? You don't want to rush it and you want to be very intentional, but particularly with the transfer portal opening up the Wednesday after or the Monday after the championship game, you can't be sitting there with an open job because you just the risk of losing the, your team is so great. And fortunately, everything worked out. But you have those moments of just, frankly, high anxiety, just making sure it works out. But we're in a great spot. Chris, I know you got to go and also get to your weekend, too. We appreciate your time. When you look at the conference with Texas and OU all but out the door, basically all but out the door with some competition still left, is there a different feel in the room when it's this, the 12 and the four, the incoming four and, and are there even meetings without Texas and OU in them? And, and how, are, how do those go? Yeah, they, you know, Texas and OU have been in the meetings um, really up until, shoot, they weren't on the call today. Today was just more of a catch-up on just, you know, conference stuff for next week um, with the meetings coming up. But it's the, there's a lot of collegiality, and it's funny saying that in our industry right now, mm-hmm. you know, because um, it, it's a great group. And everybody's in it for the right reasons. Um, you know, the, the group that's coming in from the Pac-12 with the volatility that they've been going through the, for the last couple of years, our transition working into the league and the, and the remaining eight members is what we call the existing members that were on there, the R8. Everybody's been really, really good. Everybody's in it for the right reasons. Um, it's fun because now we're, you know, six months ago, we weren't playing each other yet. We hadn't really competed in the league as we got ready for the fall. But now that to your point, we're about two thirds of the way through it. And you get to see people on their own campus during basketball and football games or whatever sporting events, but also just that, that common interest of promoting and developing the league, but also during a, a, a period of incredible volatility in our business and everybody's just trying to figure it out together. And it's really a good group. There's not any, you know, pride in ownership or anything like that. It's just, Hey, let's figure this out together and figure out the best way forward. And, um, from a competitive standpoint, I'm really excited about where we are, obviously, with basketball it's through the roof, but also what we're going to be at with football because it's not that, you know, UT or OU you dominated it. I mean, more OU, obviously, than Texas, which we all like to point out. Um, but the league's wide open. I mean, Utah is going to be a load coming in. Obviously, there's a lot of excitement around Arizona, what they've been doing in Colorado with Dion. Um, Arizona State's got a, a younger head coach and what they're building, but this league is wide open. There's not anybody in this league that's, you know, the 800 pound gorilla. And I, I use women's basketball when we were American with UConn. Every year you knew UConn, UConn was going to win women's basketball. There was just, you were just, you were, who's playing for second. That's not the case. And everybody's investing so heavily in, in their sports programs and their departments to compete. And uh, it's fun, you know, and, and knowing that we've got a chance to, to be there at the end is what's so awesome and doing it with a great group of people doing it together. Chris, there's a couple of Houston fans that have asked me to ask you about the stadium, T, uh, the, your, your football stadium at TECU. Yep. Are any, any fan experience changes? I, I, I'm just going to throw it in there since we have you on. It may be Big 12 media days before we see you again. Anything like that? Are you guys pretty set for right now? No, no. We are right in the middle of a $140 million project. We're building our football end zone facility. Um, that will be partially done for this fall. Okay. Uh, we broke ground about uh, 60 days ago. The project is, I don't want to say ahead of schedule, but because I don't want to jinx us, but we're right where we need to be. Actually, steel starts going up next week. The new video board will be operational for next fall, and then we'll move into that new building for fall of 25, which will have about right around 1,500 new premium opportunities for our fans with new suites, club, and party decks. And that thing, and then we're looking at other amenities we're going to be able to add back into the, into the building as a whole uh, once we get a little bit further along in the project to, with the money that will be available, increasing points of sale for concessions, Wi-Fi, sound system, all those things. Every time we touch a building, we're looking at ways to be additive for the fan experience. Um, more vertical transportation, moving people up and down. You know, what we're fighting in this space, and you guys know this, is how do I get people off the couch and come in and experience our venues in person? Mm-hmm. We are through the roof in basketball, obviously, much like Baylor is. Everybody's downsizing venues so you can make them more intimate. Um, 
football will still be right at 40,000 seats, maybe a couple hundred seats less than that. But what we're doing with the video board is, I didn't know this, because when we were designing it, we wanted to make sure the video board was appropriate. I was like, look, I'm not looking for any marks or awards or anything like that. I want it to be the biggest. I just want it to work and be efficient. But the reality is it'll actually be the biggest video board in the state of Texas, wow. which I did not know that. Yeah, it's going to be significant. So we're we're working towards those things to make game day the best experience possible for our fans. And it's we're never going to be satisfied with that. That'll be something that we're always tinkering with and trying to prove upon. And that's why the, the call today with Brett Yormark, you feel good about what he's doing as you move forward, and that's why you can then put the new scoreboard or video or the stadium changes, right? Because you feel good about where the Big 12 is going to be no matter what might be uh, uh, the speculation. Amen. Yeah, I mean, there's there's schools that are making decisions now to pause building construction or, or delay it as they saw the NIL. We were fortunate that we were far enough, far enough along with a fundraising around that facility, but also knowing where we need to be with what we're competing against, we had to get that done. Um, you've seen the impact with the investments we've made with basketball and now how that that trend, that program is trending. And for us with football, this is the last major construction piece we needed to get done. Everything else from here will be additive, but this was like an appendage we needed to add back into the body. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about what Big 12 is and about our future. We're going to be in a great place, and we'll be competing for championships here a lot sooner than people expect. Chris, as always, great stuff. Thank you for your time. Good luck. Have a great weekend. Good luck to the Cougars in Kansas City. You as City. well, my friends. You too. Yeah, Thank you. You, you as well, my friends. Let's see how we do tomorrow, and, and let's get through KC, and, and let's keep playing for a while. And I appreciate you guys for having me on, and have a great weekend. Go you Cougars. too. Chris Pesman, thank you uh, again for him being a part of the show. Houston and Kansas tomorrow down.